Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first ever independent speculator Q&A session. I hope this is working. Somebody give me a thumbs up out there if you see and hear me, given the little glitch we had at the start there. Okay, all right, I got my thumbs up. Thank you, COO. All right, we already have a bunch of questions in the queue here, but I wanted to start with one that is one of the most common questions I get from company types, uh, media types, readers, and so on, and that is, what do I call you? I've known you for years as Louis James, you know, who is Lobo T? Are you real? Is that really your name? <laughs> um, it is a bit of an oddball name, and hence the pen name, but I am Louis James. I am the same Louis James that you've known and loved or hated for all these years working at Casey Research. Um, but my earliest memories are being called Lobito or Lobo by my family. It's always been uh, near and dear to my heart. So I decided in the interest of transparency and just being who I am to go ahead and use my very real name, uh, Lobo Tigre. So please, by all means, do call me Lobo. That's uh, who I am and no secrets here. So I wanted to welcome you. I wanted to let you know who I am how to address me, and we'll go from here. Um, that having been said, my mission with this Q&A is truly to be as valuable to you as I can. I, I want to help. My evil plan, as I often say, is to help everybody make so much money, even my free readers, that they feel compelled to sign up for my for pay service. So I, I, I do want to help. Um, that being said, there are there's one constraint I probably should have mentioned before. I don't want to disappoint anybody, but please understand that I can't give you individual advice. That was not just a policy of my former employers. Um, that's due to SEC regulations. I'm able to publish on financial matters under what is known as the newsletter exemption. That's not actually law, but the concept is that since I'm not giving individuals advice, I'm publishing as a mere reporter of financial matters to the world. It's not individual advice, therefore I don't need to be regulated, certified, inspected, ne neglected, detected, and selected by the SEC or anybody else. That's how this business works. So uh, please don't ask me what you should do, or don't ask me, you know, if you know if I owned X shares at this price of XYZ company, you know, <laughs> when to take profits, you know, that that would be giving you individual advice. I, I really can't do that without risking getting shut down. On a related note, I want to avoid uh, too many questions about uh, current stocks in the market. Now, this may be disappointing to you, but please understand, um, if you ask me too many questions about this junior or that junior, and I talk about them, I have to say, I have to disclose if I own that. And pretty soon, I've given away my whole portfolio, and that would not be very good for my business. And if you want to have access to me and my wisdom or folly in the future, uh, you need me to stay in business. You need me to be able to feed my family too. So let's not ruin my business. <laughs> let's not get into anything that would give away uh, the for pay part of my content. I do provide uh, analysis of past picks and, and questions from readers in the for pay service. Little plug there. If you really want to know what I think about X, Y, Z stock that I might have written about in the past or something like that, I, I do take that up in The Independent Speculator, which everybody's welcome to subscribe to. Uh, but please understand, I don't want to give away the whole portfolio that, that uh, doesn't do any of us any good. So my goal here is to help you with big picture, markets, commodities, almost anything under the sun. But please don't ask me questions that would force me to disclose my portfolio. So that having been said, the very first question we've got here, uh, sort of tangential to the points I made before, uh, remember this is my first time doing this. I should have said that about individual equities before, so I don't set anybody up for disappointment. Um, but we're asked about Alexco, which may soon be in the pre-production sweet spot, the PPSS as I now call it. Um, I should clarify that the pre-production sweet spot, I didn't invent that name. It's the conventional wisdom of the so-called Lasan curve discovery, boring engineering phase, pre-production sweet spot on up into production. Uh, that's been around for a long time, longer than I've been in the business. You know, my contribution there, my discovery really, was that the sweet spot was a lot sweeter than anybody realized. The, the conventional wisdom was that everybody can see who's building a mine, 
So the success there is priced in and there's not a lot of gains in that far end of the Lassonde curve. Um, but when I asked people about that, nobody could tell me what that number was. You know, what, what was the average gain or, or, you know, is it a lot? Was it a little? Most people guess 10, 20 percent, you know, something, but not a lot. It was not of interest. And to my knowledge, I'm the first one to go out there and actually compile a, a thorough data set looking into that question. How much is the average gain uh, from a construction decision to the first pour of that beautiful little bar or copper cathode or whatever it is? Uh, so uh, my former employers in their uh, marketing prowess used to call that the golden runway. So if you've heard of the golden runway, that's what we're talking about, the pre-production sweet spot. So I don't want to talk about Alexco as specific equity uh, for the reasons I've already given. But I can answer, I think, something useful on this question. The pre-production sweet spot is the math, the numbers that we have, is very clearly defined by the starting point of the construction decision in the end point of the first pour. We also have an end point in declaration of commercial production, uh, but the first pour turned out to be the more useful end point. This is really important um, because you can measure these things. And if we tried to measure close to the pre-production sweet spot, well, how do you define that? Where would you set the beginning point? You really couldn't do that. Um, so I, one answer to this question is, you need to be very careful about applying the pre-production sweet spot uh, thinking to pre-pre-production sweet spot companies. And I, I'll confess, I've uh, taken some lumps on this myself when, we, when I discovered the pre-production sweet spot reality, which is that you know 90 plus percent of the companies make it and the average gain is on the order of 100%. They, they, out, the average gain is a double. And, and by the way, I'm redoing this research now that I'm out of Casey Research. And the numbers are very similar. So I'm feeling very good about this. It's very solid, very robust finding. So the average gain is about 100% between the construction decision and first pour. But some people that look like they're going to go into the pre-production sweet spot never do, right? They never get the money. They never get the final permit they need. Or the First Nations decide they don't want to mine in their backyard. So there are a lot of ways that a company can fail to get to the pre-production sweet spot, even if it has a project with economics on it and it looks really good. Um, so that was a, something I should have thought of. I'll take my lumps here. I should have thought of that. I should have paid more attention to that. But in uh, recent years, I think I, I got so excited about my pre-production sweet spot discovery that I, I placed bets on companies before they really were in that pre-production sweet spot. And that didn't always work out so well. So my answer, not regarding this particular equity, but this situation in general, is that going forward, personally, I'm not putting my money into the deal until all the dominoes are lined up. We have the money, we have the permits, and we have that official construction decision. Oh, we have all the pieces and they are de facto building the mine. That is something I should say. Companies do, there's no law requiring a company to put out a construction decision. Sometimes there isn't a press release on that, but there's a press release after that. We've started building the mine and I count that as a construction decision. So that was a very good question. Sorry for such a long answer, but I wanted to tease apart the bits there because I think that is something that a lot of people will have a look at. Okay, so the next question I have is about, um, you could call it market timing, or, or I'll just read the question. It says, over the past several years, several pundits have been calling for a rally in the precious metals and uranium, but nothing has moved. Why do you think this time might be any different? That's a fair question. So first, I want to say, um, you know, I guess I should call myself one of these pundits. You know, I've, I've done my own fair share of arm waving, and... Um, you know, I, I could try to evade responsibility and, and say that under my past employment, there was the KC consensus and I operated within that. Um, but that really wouldn't be entirely honest or, or honest at all, because I agreed with Doug. You know, Doug made a very convincing talk about exiting the eye of the storm after 2008. Um, and I agreed with him. I just I could not see how the powers that be would be able to kick the can down the road for something as catastrophic as 2008 was. And we were wrong. You know, uh, even if we're eventually right in this business too early is wrong. And we were wrong. So I will take the mea culpa on that. 
Uh, I would also, though, point out that I'm not a cheerleader and I'm not yay gold all the time or whatever the medal might be. If you look back over the free material at independentspeculator.com, you'll see that I did not jump on the uranium bandwagon right away. For example, I was well aware that it rallied in 2016, 2017, and those rallies fizzled. Now, I saw a series of higher highs, higher lows, and that was very significant to me. So when it rallied again in 2018 and kept and showed some real strength, I said, okay, now, now it's time. Now I'm willing to believe in this. So please, you know, check me on that. I'm not a uranium bull forever under all circumstances. And I would go farther and say that I see a very strong opportunity for uranium, but pretty limited in extent. I do think the world will move away from uranium. I think part of the whole new energy paradigm there with the so-called green energy, um, it's bad longer term for uranium. It's just not something that can be replaced right away. Obviously, you know, the world doesn't want another Fukushima anywhere. So uh, I, I think that is a business whose days are numbered. And, and the tighter the regulations and requirements, the higher the cost is. Uranium could be, should be, a very low cost base load power. But with all the fear and paranoia around it, it gets more and more expensive every time. So I see a window of opportunity now because we already have a very large nuclear fleet. The United States uh, gets about 20% of its energy from nuclear power plants. That can't just be switched off. Uh, you know, South Korea announced denuclearization for its energy supply. Well, it's easy to announce that. You know, it's a lot harder to do it when your country doesn't have a whole lot of other choices. So cost of mining is way above spot. The power plants are still there. It will take time to wean ourselves from that. So yes, I am bullish on uranium. What's different this time is that we have seen higher highs, higher lows, and the rally is much more solid this time. If you look at the spikes in 2016 and 17, the uranium fizzled uh, pretty early, and that hasn't happened yet. So I'm, I'm very bullish on uranium for this year. Uh, even 2020, I'm not so sure. But for this year, I'm very bullish on uranium. One more thing on this. Uranium is one thing. The stocks are another. And we've seen that a lot of the uranium equities, even the better ones, they take it on the chin whenever the broader markets have been hit over the last quarter. So we've seen a, a significant disconnect between uh, the uranium prices, which have more or less continued rising, uh, and the stocks, which have frequently gone down in the same week that uranium prices went up. I just don't think that's sustainable. I actually think that is setting up a terrific opportunity because you have value increasing. You know, whatever value you want to give XYZ company for its pounds in the ground or its future production, current production, um, there's some valuation there. And that is related to the price of uranium. So that is going up. At the same time, many of the prices have gone down. That never lasts. So unless the uranium rally fizzles again, which could happen, I'm not promising it, I'm just saying I'm willing to put my own money and have on a bet that it will continue to rise in 2019. And that means that the equities will have to snap back. And I believe, I don't know when that happens. Uh, you know, early can be wrong, but you know, my time horizon on this one is one year. So I don't think I'm too early. I think we'll see a significant change and a benefit to people who get into uranium. Just understand though, that if you start buying uranium stocks today, right now, right now, those same stocks are still getting hammered when the broader markets get hammered. So there's a very real possibility it, they could go down in the near term. If you can't stomach that, that's not your cup of tea. If you'd rather get on the bandwagon when it's rising, you may pay a slightly higher price, uh, but that may be okay. You know, The bandwagon is rising. Once it really clearly is rising, it, it should run for some time, and I think there's opportunities to make money. I, I think now is in near term, we get cheaper entry prices. Later, you may get higher entry prices, but less risk. Your call on that. So um, that was uranium, precious metals. I've written a whole report on my outlook for precious metals in 2019. If you haven't read, read that, uh, it's available as a free download on our website. You can go to independentspeculator.com. Um, there's one of the free articles is 2019, you know, why this time is different. That's a very direct answer to your question. Um, free report. If you're already on my mailing list, you won't even change anything. If you're not, we do ask for your email. We promise not to spam you, and you can have that and do whatever you want with it. 
the short version is I dislike the phrase perfect storm, but we may be in one of those situations this year where we've seen, um, for example, the trade war and how much that has weighed on commodities and many other things as well. It, it's, it's, it's really one of the biggest variables we've got. If that gets worse, right, if, if she and Trump can't come to a deal that they both feel good about, um, you know, that's really bad for the global economy. It's really bad, bad for equities. We have seen gold rising recently when Wall Street has declined, even on days where the dollar is rising. So the flight to safety factor that is pro-gold is in force right now. So if the trade war gets worse, that could actually be very good for gold this year. Not sometime, not somewhere this year. And this is different from previous years. This factor was not there before. If the trade war ends, on the other hand, We've seen that the trade war has weighed on all commodities and gold and silver, you know, gold bugs may not like it, but they are commodities. And except in times of systemic crisis, uh, they do tend to move with other commodities. So if the trade war ends, we could see all commodities come off the spring there, go up and, and gold and silver too. And there's a logic to that. It's not just a pattern. Um, you know, the Chinese in particular, the Indians as well, have a great affinity to gold. It's not a speculation for them. It's wealth to them. And so if the trade war ends and China and India suddenly are, ooh, let's, you know, it's back to the races. Everything's great again. They feel wealthy again. They're going to buy more gold. So that can be good for gold. And it's sort of a win-win either way. Uh, there are other black swans out there, other problems out there. If you want to look for a more... A detailed answer, please do go to uh, independentspeculator.com, look on that Y 2019 uh, link on the Speculators Digest and download the report. It should help you out. Let me know if you have further questions there. Okay, um, next question is, do I think Cameco's decent earnings announced yesterday can be a catalyst for the whole sector? I will take this on because it's not really about Cameco, it's about the whole sector. Um, I don't think decent earnings are quite enough. I think it's obviously a positive when something like that happens. But the kind of thing that we've seen really move the whole sector is, you know, a major new discovery. You know, when one of the majors or one of the juniors just has an out of the ballpark, uh, wonderful discovery. We have seen that move the entire TSX <laughs> with it in sympathy. It works in both ways, by the way, when something really bad happens, uh, you know, Briex. Uh, we can see the entire sector go down, even the companies that are doing great and adding value for shareholders. I, I don't think decent earnings from one company are enough, but I do think uh, that's very significant because we have companies shutting down production. We have the whole uranium space, you know, circling the wagons, shrinking in, very defensive. Uh, so if something if some things aren't that bad, then that should help out with the fear that people have of, oh, uranium, it, you know, may not run again. You know, but again, as per my previous answer, I, I think anybody looking at uranium stocks today has to beware that they keep getting hit when the broader markets get hit. And there are plenty of black swans out there, not even so black. There are plenty of pretty obvious things out there that could make Wall Street retreat again. Um, so until the uranium stocks stop retreating with Wall Street, I, I think it's dangerous to, to sound an all clear there. So personally, I've held on to my uranium stocks. I'm not selling because of this, but I'm not buying anymore at this point either. Not until I see this negative relationship change. What would it take to change it? I don't think it'd be good news from one company. I think significantly higher uranium prices. And by the way, I don't think just crossing the $30 line would do it. Uh, I think uh, you probably need to see 40 plus, you know, if that starts getting to the point where companies start announcing we're starting back up again, we're going back into production. I think that really changes the conversation. And if we actually get up to the 50, 60 incentive level for the industry, I think we're off to the races there. Uh, 30 would help, but as we push towards 40, I don't know where the number is, but that's when I personally expect the news from uranium itself to overpower the headwinds from other sources. Okay, next question, a catalyst to move the market beyond all these trend lines that many stocks are either trying to break back or testing. 
Well, um, I'm not a technical analyst, and I'm not just not a technical analyst, I'm a fundamentalist, right? I look at value added, I look at supply and demand around the world, and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to rain on the TA parade. You know, sometimes these patterns can be very powerful and very predictive. My problem with it is that they often are predictive until they're not. Um, <laughs> I've, I've had a hard time relying on trend lines and charts to tell me what to do. Personally, I like it when on the fundamentals, the story makes sense to me and the TA analysis agrees. So uh, frankly, I'm just gonna defer that question to a TA specialist. If you know anybody or that you like in that space, I think they're a better person to ask that. Um, that having been said, <laughs> that's my official position, but you know, I'm a human being and I'm subject to the pull as much as anybody else. There is, I wouldn't call it one trend line. I, I, maybe one of these psychologically important numbers. There is one that I'm looking at. Uh, similar to what I just said about price being, I think, important and what changes the story for uranium, I see the same thing in precious metals. Gold has been range bound. Right? We all know that. It's been range bound for years. Uh, we're all excited now that it's back above the psychologically important 1300 level, but it was higher a year ago, right? It was over 1350. So even reclaiming 1350, while that would be a great uh, profit boost for the producers, the better companies that are making money now, it would make feasibility studies look much better for companies developing quality assets. Now that would be significant. It wouldn't really constitute change. It wouldn't be different, uh, anything different. Again, going back to one of the earlier questions, what's different now? 1350, 1360, 1370 wouldn't be different. I think if we hit 1400 and hold above that, that would really make a lot of people sit up and take notice. Uh, could be wrong, we'll see. But a little spike above and then back down, that would be a flash in the pan, easily dismissed. But if it goes up there and stays there, I, I think that really brings a lot of the speculative money that has sloshed out of this sector back in again. Um, so that's one of the things I'm looking for. Okay, we have more questions here. If you had a way of connecting to like-minded people, I'd join. <laughs> well, that's a, a general. So interestingly enough, you know, my friend and mentor, Doug Casey, he really liked a book by O'Neill Stevenson called The Diamond Age. It was one of the things that we had in common. We had a reading list. Like today, people compare iPod lists. And you know you found a kindred soul when your iPod list is, is very similar. You know, Doug and I compared notes on books that we really liked. And you know, that was one of the things that made meeting Doug, like meeting my long lost brother of the mind. Uh, in the diamond age, uh, people are no longer organized by countries or race or religion or whatever, well, religion could be one, but they were organized by voluntary organization known as files. At some point when we have critical mass here, we may start uh, an independent speculator file. Uh, until then, I give credit where due to my friend Doug, you know, people who are like-minded with Doug tend to be very like-minded with me. So Casey files are still a great place and they still exist. You know, Doug organized files along that Neil Stevenson idea. And some of those are still active um, at internationalman.com. They're restarting that idea. They call that file one. So these are places to meet like-minded persons uh, unfortunately, in the real world, it's not so easy to find physical concentrations of people you can go and hang out with. And one of those would be Doug's real estate development in Argentina, which is one reason why I bought into that initially. I, I uh, couldn't really see myself spending a lot of time in Argentina, but it's beautiful. And the people you met there were really interesting people. So I don't want to steer anybody necessarily in that direction, just want to say that it's there and there are other opportunities like that will, will surely happen um, and it can be interesting meanwhile we have online communities uh, by the way I do answer email from readers I can't give you individual advice but the good news is that <laughs> my business is still small enough that I can keep up with email from readers and I do um, so I encourage people to get in touch and, and I will be as helpful as I have time to be Okay, what is the best way to speculate on short-term time movement of gold and silver? <laughs> the, 
that's a very interesting question because I've actually been playing with this. It occurred to me, you know, the answer before has really been, don't do this. It's too volatile. It's too dangerous. Uh, you know, if you are, you know, the rational speculator is not a gambler. He's not a day trader. He's or she is someone who sees a trend and is willing to bet on being right, like even against the herd. That's that's the kind of speculation that I was taught. And so short term volatility, how to play that, you know, options and, and things to do to, to take to take advantage of movements. Uh, you know, when something gets too extreme on, on the stochastics or on the RSI, you know, there's ways to play that, but it's it's very dangerous. That having been said, I have, <laughs> I confess, I have thought about playing with this. I have even tried a little bit. Um, one of the developments is the ETFs, of course. If you wanted to play the short-term volatility on gold and silver, well, before you had the premiums of going in and out of the physical metals. And so that added expense. And, but it was important that it be on the physical metals because a company is not the same thing. You know, XYZ Gold Company, even if they're a great producer, they could have force majeure in some mine somewhere and they could crater overnight or the junior could come up dry and important drill results. You know, so the stocks are not all the same in the metals. So you needed a way, a low cost way to trade on the metals themselves. And the ETFs have provided that. There's liquidity. Now, personally, I don't, see the ETFs as a way of owning gold and silver, but I do see them as a cheap and easy way to trade on gold and silver. Now, the other new part of this is the advent of things like Robinhood. And Robinhood, uh, for those who don't know, Robinhood.com, Robinhood, one word, uh, is free trading for U.S. stocks. And they're adding more services there, but I've tried it. It really does work. It really is free, zero commissions. Uh, they make their money by encouraging people to open uh, leverage uh, margin accounts, which I never do, um, but it works. So if you combine the ETFs as a liquid and easy way to trade the day-to-day, -day, even intraday volatility in the metals with free trading, zero cost trades from Robin Hood, well, now there's no cost for me to dance in and out of positions. And if I see indicators that tell me it's going to go one way or the other, I could play that. Now, that's the idea. It was a beautiful idea. I tried a couple trades, um, but it turned out that even in that low-cost environment, the volatility was so great that by the time I saw my triggers, and, and my triggers worked, you know, I, I developed a model, we back-tested it, and in theory, it would have worked uh, like 67% of the time. And that would have been great. But in practice, by the time you see the trigger, then you jump in, the price isn't there anymore. If you don't use a stop loss, you can get creamed on the way down, but the stop loss gets triggered by too much volatility along the way. So that's a long way of saying, I've actually tried this. So it's not a theoretical answer that I'm giving you here. Based on my experience, even with low cost ways of doing this, I still have not found a reliable way to make money trading in the short term volatility. Uh, it, there's got to be a way to do it. I haven't figured it out yet. If somebody has, I'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, you know, to be continued. It is a subject of great interest to me now that we have these uh, low-cost ways of testing it out. Okay, next question. That's not a question. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so thank you for the for the kind words. Now you're making me blush. It is possible to make a wolf blush under his fur, by the way. You know, Lobo means wolf. I'm sure most of you know that. But, uh, okay. Somebody has asked me to please comment on can Alaska uranium is, is the Manitoba nickel exploration a sound strategy? Okay, so for those of you who've joined since the beginning, I am uh, not commenting on individual equities like this. I apologize. I hope I don't disappoint you too many. If there's an issue with Manitoba nickel or something, we could maybe talk about that. In this case, I'm going to defer because I haven't looked at it. But I don't want to answer questions about individual equities because I would have to disclose if I own them, and that would give away my whole portfolio. And it also gets me a little bit closer to that individual advice uh restriction from the SEC that I that I can't go there. So I apologize if you were really hoping to hear what I think about the stock that you're worried about the most or something, really can't go there today. Um, 
But I, I understand if you want to ask about the type of stock, you know, that is something that I may be able to help you with. Okay, next question. How will the transition away from oil and coal as base power supply affect gold and silver? Huh. Well, that's a very interesting question. And most people will say, well, how would that transition away affect the energy metals, right? Copper and all those other obvious things. Um, so I've not thought of this. Off the cuff, I would say I don't see it affecting gold very much, but I have written a great deal about how silver really is an energy metal, at least right now. I mean, there are models in the lab of new solar panels that don't use silver or use radically less silver. But right now, all the commercial solar panels in deployment in the marketplace now use substantial amounts of silver. Even the Tesla solar roof uses quite a bit to the point where the typical single family home in the United States uh, would use a couple kilos, at least a kilo of silver on their roof to go solar. So there is a very serious impact as the world goes in this direction for silver specifically. So this is one of the reasons why I say, well, if you're a gold bull in 2019 or a gold bull period, you should be a raging silver bull because we've seen in the past, there are times where, and this is one of those things where I've been doing a lot of research on when the gold silver ratio changes. A lot of people ask me about the gold silver ratio, you know, silver is so cheap compared to gold, does that mean silver has to go up? Well, if you look at just the gold silver ratio by itself, no, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> yes, when the gold silver ratio gets very extreme, it has a tendency to come back to the average, uh, but that can happen by gold falling just as easily as by silver rising. So, it, it, and we, I've looked for the correlation in the past. It, I just don't see the gold silver ratio itself as a predictive tool, not reliably. But if you look at the gold silver ratio, and by the way, you can look for my silver articles. For, there's several free articles on this at independentspeculator.com. Just put in a little search tool on the left column at the top, put silver, and hopefully you won't get too many false positives. Uh, but maybe type in GSR or gold silver ratio. That will help you find this. So the GSR itself, uh, I don't find predictive, but you see trends within it. And what these trends tell us is that there are certain times and certain conditions at the market where silver tends to take off. Now, this is one of those things like I was telling you about the, the trading on the volatility of gold and silver. I'm still trying to figure this out. I don't have a very reliable set of trigger conditions that says, yes, this is the time to pile into silver. It's about to go nuts. But my sense is from looking at the data that it happens in generally rising markets. That's a precondition. And then if there's a perception of a coming supply crunch on the silver side, like if gold and silver were rising at a time where base metals, industrial metals were tanking and copper mines were going offline and zinc mines were going offline, and these are the supply source of most silver today. Most silver doesn't come from silver primary mines. Most of it comes from the great big copper mines and secondarily the you know uh, lead zinc mines that have strong silver credits. Um, so if the demand for industrial metals is tanking at a time where gold and silver are rising, then this sets up at least the perception of one of these perfect storms. And that seems to be uh, one of the triggers that can cause a silver to go on one of its mini manias way above gold. Um, that may be the case today. We have the setups with the trade war. One possible outcome is this type of silver mini mania this year. So I'm not predicting that. I'm saying it's one of the cards on the table. And if it looks like that's coming together, uh, you know, I may have to uh, pawn my watch or something to try to really double down on more silver plays. So a uh, bit of a long answer, uh, but a different case scenario. I, I really don't see the shift away from oil and gas as being one way or the other for uh, gold. Uh, I do see it being very important for silver. And, and maybe the question was, will that be disrupted? And would that disruption be good for gold? I'm not sure how disruptive that's going to be. We're talking about a multi-year process. It's very clear to me that the big energy players today, they see the writing on the wall. You know, Exxon is not going to go out of business because of the new energy paradigm. Exxon's going to become a different energy company. And it's not just going to be an oil and gas company in the future. So I, I would not assume that the new energy paradigm means the whole world goes into a meltdown. All right, next question. What is more important, deposit or the people involved? 
Uh, that's a that's an excellent question, and I would absolutely, without question, answer people involved. Um, when Doug Casey taught me the seven P's of resource stock evaluation <laughs> 15 years ago when I started with him, then it became the eight P's, then it became the nine P's. Uh, I think he's back down to eight P's now. They must have consolidated some P's there. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, what, another P's. And the first P was always people. And Doug told me, you know, Lobo, the best rocks in the world can be screwed up by the wrong people. And I've, I've seen this. And you've probably seen this, you know, when when a junior picks up a, a property that the majors just didn't care about anymore, or they, you know, they mined it out, they high graded it, they didn't have the vision, and somebody else comes along and proves it up. Or uh, I can mention AUEX because the company no longer exists, right? They picked up that property off trend in Nevada, Long Canyon. Somebody had drilled it before and missed and missed and missed and hit on one hole. And Ron Peratt, the AUEX team, came in with a different idea um, and drilled it in a different angle. And, you know, boom, 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 boom. They hit in every hole. And that turned into a spectacular almost 20-bagger uh, for us in the past. You know, it was one of, my, one of the bigger wins in my career. Um, and that was a, an example of people came in and without a very creative way of looking at the rocks, you know, or, or, you know it's beyond me why anybody would drill vertical holes uh, in this day and age, even if I was thinking that my target was a flat lying target, uh, what if it's not, you know, <laughs> why not learn more about it, which you do with angle holes. So the wrong people can absolutely screw up the best rocks in the world. Uh, so I, when, when I get a new idea, when somebody, a reader suggests something or, or a promoter suggests something, you know, I'll look at anything and, you know, my, my, one of my strengths is a very fast triage project. And the very first thing I do is I don't even look at the project or their grades or whatever. I go to the website and I go to the management tab and the director's tab and I look at the people. And if I see people on there that have lied to me in the past or have failed time and again, or I Google them and I just keep on finding, you know, lawsuit after lawsuit and, and disaster after disaster, I just don't go there. You know, maybe they get lucky. Maybe they have such spectacular results that it turns into a great success. Um, but, you know, if if I bet on bad people and I lose money, I just feel so stupid. Uh, and I'm just not going there. So definitely, definitely people. And by the way, people, as we were just discussing with AUEX, people can take what seemed to be a bad project and the right people who envision it the right way can completely turn that around. So absolutely no question, people number one. Okay, uh, next question. Big respect to Doug, an international man. I live in a terribly socialistic place. Isn't that the whole world now? No. Um, and that connection is a lifeline to sanity. Once I have more funding, I will be joining you uh, in your panel. Oh, thank you, okay, I thought we were getting to a question about how to internationalize, where to internationalize. Uh, so let me answer the unanswered question. There is an article on, uh, again, one of the freak articles on top 10 reasons to internationalize. And that does not, by the way, mean selling everything and moving off to the mountains of Nepal somewhere to sit on a mountaintop with, uh, you know, the guru Casey or whomever. Um, obviously, if you expatriate, you can get out of a high tax jurisdiction with leverage. But th there is sort of a soft internationalization. There are ways to internationalize your life, your assets, your business um, without actually fully expatriating. And so I, I go over some of that, uh, look up internationalization in the search uh, utility there, and you'll find my tips on that. As you can see, I have not left the United States. I'm in Puerto Rico, which is part of the United States. Um, but it gives me a little bit of the benefits of both. I can hang on for family reasons to my US citizenship, not expatriating. Um, but the tax incentives here are truly phenomenal. Uh, you know, the 4% corporate tax rate, it's real. I've seen it. You know, the zero capital gains tax for 20 years is, you know, for me as a speculator, a person who, who does um, deploy cash for capital gains, uh, to have zero capital gains tax without having to leave the United States is, is a huge advantage. Yes, you do have to live here. And if you don't like to hear Spanish on the streets, you may not find it worth it, uh, but it's real, it really does work. Oh, by the way, 
this is an added part of the trading uh, the volatility question we had earlier. One of the things that made me particularly interested in seeing if I could trade short-term volatility in precious metals using the ETFs and using the free trading platform and Robinhood is that if I had short-term gains, <laughs> they're still tax-free for me right now under my uh, deal with the Puerto Rican government. And that's what you get. It's not just a status. You get a contract with the government of Puerto Rico if your application is a is approved under Act 22. So under my Act 22 decree, I have zero capital gains tax until 2036. So I could trade in and out of gold and silver ETFs all day, you know, all year and book thousands of short-term trades, and that would have no tax consequences for me. So this is another thing that made that particularly interesting. Despite that, despite the free trading, despite the no tax consequences, I still found that the volatility uh, tended to eat my lunch. You know, I could get my money back, but unless I just happened to get lucky, I didn't bag a whole lot uh, playing the volatility. And and getting lucky, even though I'm a speculator, that's not my business plan. You know, my business plan is to apply my mind, my experience, my connections, my friendships with Doug and Rick and everybody to do everything in my power to put the odds in my favor and in favor of my readers. I'm not a wild gambler. That's not my kind of speculation. Um, my question is, how can I educate myself to understand mining companies' news releases, kind of resource investor for dummies? Well, this was actually a question I was going to ask the audience, and you're welcome to reply in the chat or send me an email or use one of the forms on independentspeculator.com, whatever way you want to reply. One of my questions to you is, if I do a series of master classes, as they say now in YouTube land, uh, would you be interested? I could do a Speculation 101 Masterclass. This is a broad Q&A, but we could have a more focused session where I go over the basics of speculation, you know, what to do, what you need, and so on, and maybe a, a 201 afterwards. And, but I could also do something more specific like this, you know, reading mining company press releases. Uh, do you care or do you just want to be told what it means? Uh, do you want to learn? If enough people want to do this, if you're interested in parsing mining press releases, that's absolutely something I can do. It wouldn't be giving anybody individual advice. It would be simply examining examples and what does this mean? Is that good grade? Is that not good grade? What, what does this metallurgy mean? Um, that's, that's something I would be very happy to do as long as there's an audience for it. Uh, so one answer is I may be able to help you with that. Uh, the next answer might be, sorry, there isn't a really good book on that yet. I wish I could say, read this book. That'll help you out. Uh, there are a few books out there on economic geology. That is a help, but I really haven't found one that, that helps the junior resource investor or speculator in the way that I think they need help with this stuff. So that's a book project of, of mine in my copious spare time. You know, hopefully as the business grows here. My plan is to be able to bring on more help, expand my team, and then I'll have more time for projects like that. You know, uh, I'm chief bottle washer here too, along with my uh, beautiful COO and partner in life. So very small team here with, with uh, a couple of extra helpers. But, but that is a book project. That's probably the number one book project I have in mind. Um, sorry, I don't have another resource to point you out, but maybe this masterclass will do it for us. Okay, next question. Uh, how does a Puerto Rican residency work out? I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Um, I will say that the tax benefits are real. They have worked out. When I moved here, and by the way, I lived in Washington State before I moved to Puerto Rico. Washington is one of those wonderful W states that has no state income tax. So I moved not from New York or California, one of those high tax environments. I moved from a state with no income tax to Puerto Rico. And my next net tax burden from the year before to the year when I moved here was still a 60% reduction in overall tax burden. You, you still have to pay taxes. It's not a get out of jail free card. And by the way, the, the, the deal is only on Puerto Rican income, uh, which capital gains are. But if you have other sources of income in the United States, you still pay the normal U.S. taxes. I was hoping I'd never have to file a 1040 again when I moved here. Didn't work out that way. Uh, but the benefits were real and they were huge, like I say, on the order of 60% tax reduction legally. So great move for me. Uh, as far as living here goes, 
it, I, I'm very honest with you, it's absolutely not for everyone. Like I said before, if you don't want to hear people speaking Spanish on the streets around you, deal with broken pavements and so on, it, this is America's little piece of the third world. No offense to my Puerto Rican friends, it's just a fact. Uh, you know, this is not the wealthiest corner of America. And yes, you can live in a gated community uh, with other expats and surround yourself in a little English bubble, but it is a bubble. And that's not Puerto Rico. And anytime you leave that gated community, you have the rest of it out there. Um, that having been said, it's not as scary as a lot of people might fear. I mean, I, I go out in the middle of the night to go shopping all of a sudden for something I suddenly need in the middle of the night. I have never felt in personal danger doing that, going out on the street, walking and so on. Uh, I've been here with my wife, with my kids. I've been here uh, going on four, going on five years, I have never personally felt in danger. Uh, yes, there are scary headlines out there. There's a reason for that. Uh, you know, it may be too long an answer to get into right now. But what I'm personally saying is, if you can stomach the culture shock, or if it's not a culture shock for you, you know, my wife is from the Republic of Belarus, so English is a second language. So hearing Spanish, you know, that doesn't phase her. Uh, you know. It's a real issue, though. And if you're going to be miserable here, if this is not the place for you, you know, maybe the tax incentives aren't worth it. Uh, but for me, you know, I, <laughs> my mother's from Mexico. I grew up speaking Spanish. Uh, I have no problem at all with the culture here. Uh, I don't go looking for trouble. It hasn't looked for me. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm very happy to be living just off the beach. I'm looking out the window right now. The palm trees are swaying in the wind. The parasailers are out there on the waves. Uh, and I have huge tax deductions. So I'm, I'm a very happy camper with the move. For me and my family, it was a great move. Okay, next question. Uh, do I owe bit owing Bitcoin? Uh, I do not. I do have some Ethereum. Uh, I, I just threw some in there because why not? At the time, my, my logic is <laughs> probably going to start a religious war here. Uh, my logic was that Bitcoin does one thing. Ethereum does something like that, but is useful in many more ways. So maybe I'll just buy some Ethereum just, just because why not? Um, but by the time I was convinced that this was a, a trend in motion that, that could work out well, it was very late in the game. Um, and I just, I just was not willing to bet on something that had already gone vertical. Now, the, Honestly, that was probably a mistake. It continued to go vertical after I bought. I probably don't know that I could have tripled my money if I had really moved into Bitcoin or, or Ethereum in a big way back in 2017. I just put a token amount, you know, a few hundred dollars. Uh, and it did double uh, before crashing back down again. If I had put a lot more in, you know, maybe I could have made more money, but I don't know if I would have sold. I don't know if I would have got out on time. The, the reversal was so sharp. I could have ended up losing money. Uh, and now, because it was play money for me, you know, who knows? Maybe maybe the cryptos come back. Maybe my Ethereum will be useful for something else, even if not as an investment in itself. Maybe there is a better mousetrap uh, that uses Ethereum as part of its technology, and I want to be able to participate in that. I do get the distributed ledger technology. I do think that truly is revolutionary. I think there will be big money made on the right fintech applications using uh, the block, if not the blockchain, other distributed ledger technologies, and not just fintech. I can see many applications for this. Um, personally, I don't feel tech savvy enough to decide which ones of those are a great bet. So I really haven't moved into that space. Uh, I'm just sort of on the sidelines. And if I miss out, I miss out. I would rather speculate on things I understand and I feel strong about than to just throw money around and, and hope to get lucky. Now, one last thing on this, there's uh, an interview that I did with Doug Casey. I haven't had one of our famous conversations with Casey for, for many years. Uh, so Doug and I sat down recently and we had a really good long heart to heart on many issues. And I asked him this same question, you know, how do you know which one to get into? <laughs> his answer was a very candid, well, I have my own crypto guru. And I, and I take his advice, and that's worked out very well for me. Uh, this conversation with Doug, by the way, is available for download. It's a free download on our website. It's quite long, so it's not really good for just you know a little uh, web page there. It's a, it's a PDF you can download. Um, 
both at my website, uh, independentspeculator.com, and at internationalman.com. Uh, we shared it. Uh, you can look for Conversation Doug Casey in the search tool on my website. You can download that there if you're interested. Uh, Doug and I covered a lot of ground, and it was a fun conversation. And I wasn't quite in the pit. I didn't have many irreverent questions, but I did ask him what he's learned uh, since the crash of 2008. And uh, it, it was a fun conversation. I encourage those who haven't seen it to give it a, a look. Okay, people are liking the masterclass idea. Any preferred jurisdictions with respect to uranium? U.S., Athabasca, Africa. Um, obviously, the U.S. is a special plus right now. Now, I don't know whether the Department of Commerce's investigation, 232 investigation into uranium, is as sure a thing as it seemed before the Democrats uh, took over control of the House of Representatives of the United States. I can see political interference happening in that. Um, you know, a lot of the new green deal, right? You know, those people don't want to see nuclear power encouraged in the United States. And I, I can't say what they might do or what not. We, we still have Republicans in the Senate. We still have a Republican president. You know, maybe the Department of Commerce comes out with a finding and they do uh, require U.S. utilities to buy a certain percentage of the uranium from U.S. suppliers. Uh, fortunately, the uranium price rally looks strong enough that we don't have to have that happen. But if it does happen, there's no question. There's there's a tailwind there. So as a speculator, I like a situation that's a, a win, win more. You know, win, lose, not so much. Win, win more, I like that a lot. You know, if this 232 thing happens, we get a great tailwind for U.S. uranium plays at all of them. You know, the, the explorers, producers in between, they would all stand to benefit. And so that makes the U.S. a particularly interesting place for uranium investors to look today. You know, obviously Canada is mine friendly. Obviously the Athabasca Basin, whoo I said that right, is uh, you know, a great place to make discoveries. People have made fortunes on high grade discoveries there. I'm sure there's more to come, uh, you know, as the, as the rally comes into force, as we get to the point where the equities, not just uranium, the metal, but the equities are rallying with uranium. When that becomes a thing happening now, not imminent, not inevitable, but happening now, uh, I think that Canadian high-grade plays in uh, the Athabasca Basin are a shoo-in. Those are magnets for uranium investors. Those grades are off the charts, of course. Um, I'm very, very hesitant about Africa in general, uh, I have had my posterior handed to me numerous times. I've made money there too. Um, so basically, I, I wouldn't rule Africa out. I wouldn't call it a no-fly zone. And by the way, you know, Africa is a continent, not a country. Not all the countries are the same. So case-by-case -case basis. But I want a very steep Africa discount before I look at an Africa play. I want a, you know, a no-brainer of a great project. I want visible cooperation from the local government. And I want it cheap. And if I can get that, sure, I'll look at an Africa play. Uh, but if I can, you know, get something in, in mind-friendly Saskatchewan and there's only so much money to go around, I'm going to Saskatchewan first. And if there's something in the U.S. that's now looking really good and poised to benefit to me, you know, with or without the 232 tailwind, well, you know, that would actually be the first of firsts. So, and there are other places, you know, there are actually quite a few uh, uranium is not that rare. There are quite a few jurisdictions with interesting uranium projects, South America, Argentina. Uh, it's interesting. But basically, while I have opportunities, while the stocks are on sale in the safer jurisdictions, and particularly one with this potential tailwind in the United States, you know, why would I take on more political risk uh, when I don't need to? All right, next question. Sprott has a lot of info that helps. That's true. I will. That's not a question, but yes, I would uh, give a nod to our good friends at Sprott. Sprott's Thoughts, Rick Rule, one of my mentors and friends. There's a lot of quality free material available on the Sprott website. I'll even give a nod to one of my competitors. Um, of all my esteemed peers, I think the one I see as uh, the one I'm, I'm most comfortable steering people to is Brent Cook. 
Uh, he is a geologist, a professional geologist. He really knows this stuff. And one of the things that actually I've been learning from Brent, you know, I, I would stand next to him in the field uh, at mines and stuff and just shut up and listen to his questions early on. He taught me so much. One of the things I've learned recently from him and it's, it's really been important to me is what he call, he calls um, looking for failure or making sure you ask these questions, you know, what is failure? And this is a Brent Cook specialty where he has all of his experience and expertise as a, as a bona fide geologist. And he wants to disqualify not only triage on the entry point, but on the exit side, when you invest in something and it's not working out, he wants to get out as quickly as possible. If possible, he wants to get out before everybody else realize that this is going to be a failure. So that is a, a tip of the hat to Brent Cook there. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for his work, the quality of his work, and his acumen as a stock picker. So um, if, uh, if you want more than me, <laughs> that would be the first stop. I will recommend my competitor there. I, I think Brent is a straight shooter. He's known for publicly criticizing bad players in the field. You know, he seems to be about as fearless as Doug Casey. So hats off there. Okay. Um, I don't know what you think about vanadium, positive fundamentally, but overpriced. Actually, this is something that's very much on my radar. And uh, if I can toot my own horn a little bit, I will point readers at the free articles at independentspeculator.com. Do a search in that search thing for vanadium. You'll come up with the different things I've written about vanadium all year. And you'll see that I didn't just jump on the bandwagon of hooray, hooray, yay, prices are up. I, I keep saying it and I want you to really believe it because I'm not a cheerleader. It's not my job to promote anybody, anything, any metal, any stock. It's my job to make money for my readers. And if something looks like it's going up too fast, too quick, then it's my job to call that out. So I did that and I said that uranium, sorry, vanadium, the reasons for it going up are real. You know, one, China put this new rebar or, or steel content rules in place. They have new regulations that require a higher vanadium content, 33% more in structural rebar. You know, that's a real thing. That is a game changer. And it's not reversible. It's not going away. The, the Chinese understand that they need to up their game and the quality of their construction. Uh, you know, they've had buildings fall over, <laughs> things like that. You know, they understand. And so that's a one-way change. And it's bullish vanadium. Now, does a 33% increase in required vanadium content in something that's mostly iron uh, justify a 500% increase in vanadium prices? I don't think so. Uh, there's more to it. There is the vanadium battery story, and I do see that as potentially another game changer. Um, you know, a whole bunch of little lithium batteries tanked up in this farm somewhere is, is not a very efficient way to make an industrial scale battery. And the lithium batteries have, you know, lifespans of certain issues. They have heat issues. There are a lot of issues and reasons why we need a better technology for that. And vanadium is one of those answers. These big vanadium flow batteries can provide electrical storage on a commercial scale. This is not new technology. It's been around since the 60s. Um, it just didn't matter very much until the cost of these unreliable or, or you know, daytime only uh, energy or wind blowing only energy sources when the cost of those started coming down to where they could start to compete commercially, that's when large scale batteries like these vanadium flow batteries became relevant. So I see that as, as potentially a big tailwind for vanadium prices. Now there are other technologies. Vanadium isn't the only answer here. It is, I think, the more tried and tested and it's a long way from the lab to the market. Something else I've written about in numerous cases. So vanadium batteries are off the shelf, plug and play, ready to go. So bullish on vanadium, yes. But what is the right price? You know, to, does even that justify the 500% increase? Well, maybe if the whole world goes to large scale vanadium storage over the coming decades, yes. But that's the coming decades. The question is what happens now? And so throughout 2018, I was saying too much, too fast, it's gonna correct, and I was right. And it, it's, it's come crashing back down. If you look at the long-term chart, it looks like a spike that's still on a vertical fall. If you look at the nearer-term chart, 
say the year chart, you can see that vanadium came screeching down and it stopped and it's actually ticked back up again in China. Still falling in Europe, but it's sort of flat right now. All I'm saying is if you look at the big picture, you can't count that flat area right now that we see in recent vanadium pricing as the new floor or the new normal. We don't know yet. Bigger picture, that could just be a shoulder on a pattern down. Yes, UTA fans, I did just say shoulder. Um, you know, we just don't know yet. And again, I am a rational speculator. I'm not a wild gambler. I want to see where that floor is. I don't see it yet. When we have it, then we can start doing some calculations on what does this mean? What, what does this price mean? Uh, I do think it's going to be higher than in the past. I just don't know what it's going to be yet. I'm thinking my wild guess, if you will, is maybe around $10. That means still overpriced now, if that's right. Uh, but if the current level holds, you know, the current $17 to $18 price range, that is a very good price. That changes things for a lot of these uh, uranium vanadium plays in a big way. So very significant. I'm watching it closely. I'm looking for a stable uh, or, a, or a credibly solid new vanadium price before I start implementing that. All right. I've been going here for an hour. We still have a few questions. Um, maybe I'll take one or two more, uh, but I wet my whistle here. But I think I've probably abused your good Grace is enough for an hour. Let me see if I can find a, a really good one here. We'll try to wrap up. Let's see. Okay, disclosure, thank yous, big opportunities in Ethereum, sustainable energy and mining operations, paradigm shift, or appealing marketing. Ah, okay, that's, that's an interesting question. Okay, is the new energy paradigm a game changer for mining, or is that just marketing? Oh, yes, we have wind turbines now to power our, our mine. Well, I think I'm inclined more towards the, the marketing answer here. Uh, clearly, if you have a very remote project and the cost of bringing in uh, barrels of fuel on a float plane, say, or whatever, are, are serious, then being able to have a, a, a renewable source of energy or a local source of energy without having to be sitting on an oil well, you know, that, that could be a big plus. Um, but <laughs> just because there's a great big gold deposit in the middle of nowhere in Alaska, say, that doesn't mean that that's a great place for a wind farm, or it doesn't mean that there's geothermal power there. Or and if it's in Alaska, that doesn't mean you're gonna get a lot of sunlight for large parts of the year. So it's not necessarily, uh, very practical. For, for Mother Nature to have been particularly generous endowing a very large uh, mineral resource with reliable wind power or some other form of renewable energy, it, it let's just say it's not going to happen very often. If you're lucky enough to really have that, you do a feasibility study, the numbers show that this really works, great. You know, that's a wonderful plus. Uh, but I want to see the numbers. You know, show me the math. I have seen uh, occasions where the math really wasn't that supportive. I, I remember, for example, uh, Guyana Goldfields. Uh, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about individual equities today, but I'm not talking about the company. I'm talking about the example of they had included in their feasibility study, you know, with and without a run a river project that they uh, were able to do with that. And uh, they opted not to build it. So the ability to self generate. It's, it's really not about how great it sounds or, or the PR, it's about the math. You know, show me the math. If this makes the project better, if it adds to my IRR, great. Otherwise, I don't wanna hear about it. Okay, I'll, I'll take one last question here because <laughs> I, I think my, my voice is ready to rest here after an hour. Uh, is there anything that can derail the uranium market? Boy, we got a lot of uranium bugs on here today. So uh, hats to, off to you. I, I commend your courage here. It has been a contrarian play for a long time uh, and that you're willing to look at it when many people are not willing to jump in yet. Uh, that, that says that you're independent speculators. I like that. So what could derail it? Well, obviously another Fukushima, right? These are not everyday events. Obviously, you can make a lot of money between the Fukushimas, but if there is another one, you know, 
Uh, it doesn't matter how great a project is. It doesn't matter if somebody's making money. Uh, the stocks will take it on the chin. This is unpredictable. So anybody who's even thinking about uranium as a speculation, let alone investment, I wouldn't think of uranium as an investment under any circumstances, even the biggest companies in the space. Any kind of uh, financial move on uranium is a speculation. Uh, now, you know, something like another Fukushima, another Three Mile Island, a Chernobyl would absolutely take us down. But this is not something you can predict. This isn't something you can chart. We can't say, okay, on average, it's 10 years between disasters, so there won't be another one for another 8.7 years. It's not like that. It happens or it doesn't. These are independent variables. Could happen tomorrow. Um, but at the same time, we do know that these are very rare events and that a great deal of money can be made within them. So as a speculator, I'm looking at trends that make me bullish on uranium right now. Um, and this wild card of a potential disaster, it's out there, but it's utterly unpredictable. So I'm willing to take that unpredictable chance because I know it's rare, whereas the trend that's happening now looks very solid. So solid trend on the uptrend right now versus unknowable rare event, I, I'm willing to go there. If you're not, don't go there. Uh, can uranium be replaced with thorium or some other thing? Yes, but it's not happening. Yes, but it would take years. Yes, 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 but it's a long way from the lab to the marketplace. Kind of like what I was saying about with the vanadium. Uh, uranium, current fission power technology is tried and true. It's off the shelf, despite the hysteria. It's the cleanest, greenest baseload form of power out there. Uh, and it can't be substituted right away. Absolutely no question it will be. Uh, it's scary. People don't like it. It will be uh, replaced over time, but it's not going to happen quick. Fuel is needed now. It can't be mined generally at current prices, so I'm extremely bullish in the near term. I'm going to have to leave it at that. Thank you all very much. Please feel free to post more comments, even questions. I may be able to take them up in print in an article in Speculator's Digest. If it's about individual equities, I would reserve that for paying customers. I do need to eat. Uh, you're welcome to subscribe to the Independent Speculator. Um, but I will do what I can to help you. It looks like this was pretty popular, well-received, so we'll probably do it again sometime. And uh, it looks like the masterclass idea was well-received, so send me your suggestions. What do you want a masterclass on? I can help you read press releases. What else do you want to know? If there's enough interest, I'll do a masterclass for you free of charge. Thank you, ladies, gentlemen, speculators. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your weekend, and we'll see you soon.